Chapter 7. There is no counter for a spirited woman except spirited drink. R. Butler. You've known for some time that I'm a fighting man. What you don't seem to realize is what that implies. We were sitting over wine now in a much more relaxed conversation than when I had been pretending to be King Roderick. Fighting men recognize people as much by movement and mannerism as they do by facial feature. It's a professional habit. Now, you had the appearance and voice of the king, but your carriage and gestures were that of the, of the great Skeeve, not Roderick V. But if you knew I was an impostor, why didn't you say something? The general drew himself up stiffly. The king had not taken me into his confidence in this matter, nor had you. I felt it would have been rude to intrude on your affairs uninvited. Weren't you afraid that I might be a part of some plot to murder the king and take his place? Lord Magician, though we met as rivals, prolonged exposure to you has caused my respect for you to grow to no small matter. Both in your convincing Big Julie and his army to defect from the mob and join Postletum as honest citizens, and in fighting at your side in the big game when you risked life and limb to rescue a comrade in peril, you have shown integrity, courage, and honor. While I may still speak of you from time to time in less than glowing terms, my lowest opinion of you does not include the possibility of your having a hand in murdering your employer. Thank you, General. And besides, only a total idiot would want to assume Roderick's place so soon before his marriage to Queen Hemlock. I winced. So much for your growing respect. I said ingenuity, courage, and honor. I made no mention of intelligence. Very well, then. A total idiot or someone under orders from his king. How about a bit of both, I sighed. I suspected as much, Badax nodded. Now that we're speaking candidly, may I ask as to the whereabouts of the king? Good question. In a few depressing sentences, I brought him up to date on my assignment and Roderick's disappearance. I was afraid something like this would happen, the general said when I concluded. The king has been looking desperately for some way out of this marriage, and it looks like he's found it. Well, needless to say, if there's anything I can do to help, just ask. Thanks, General. As a matter of fact, I, as long as it doesn't go against the good of the kingdom, Bad X amended, like helping you to escape. Postletum needs a king, and for the time being, you're it. Oh, well, how about using your men to help find the king? Bad X shook his head. Can't do it. Masha has, this, has that assignment. If I, sent all, if, I, if I sent my men to back her up, she'd think I didn't have any faith in her. Terrific. I had an ally if I could get around his loyalties and amorous entanglements. The general must have noticed my expression. Anything else I'd be willing to do. Like what? Well, like teaching you to defend yourself against your bride-to-be. That actually sounded promising. Do you think we'll have enough time? With that, there was a heavy knocking at the door. Your Majesty, the carriage of Queen Hemlock is approaching the palace. No, said the general with disheartening honesty. We barely made it to our appointed places ahead of the Queen's procession. The throne of Prostitum had been temporarily moved to a position just inside the doors to the palace, and only by sprinting through the corridors with undignified abandon were Badax and I able to reach our respective positions before the portals were thrown open. Remind me to have a word with you about the efficiency of your army's early warning system, I said to the general as I sank into my seat. I believe it was the court magician who complained about the excessive range of the military spy system, Badax retorted. Perhaps your majesty will see fit now to convince him of the property of the necessity of timely uh, information. Before I could think of a sufficiently polite response, the queen's party drew to a halt at the foot of the stairs. The kingdom of impasse had apparently spared no expense on the, carriages, on the queen's carriage. If it was not actually fashioned of solid gold, there were sufficient quantities of the metal in the trim and decorations to make the appearance academic, or to make the difference academic. I took secret pleasure that Grimble was not present to gloat at the scene. The curtains were drawn, allowing us to see the rich embroidery upon them, but not who or what was within. A team of eight matched horses completed the rig, though their shaggy coats and short stature suggested that normally the mountain folk put them to far more practical use than dragging royalty around the countryside. With the carriage, however, any semblance of decorum about the Queen's procession vanished. Her escort consisted of at least twenty retainers, all mounted and leading extra horses, though whether these were relief mounts or the bride's dowry I couldn't tell. The escort was also all male and of a uniform appearance, broad-shouldered, narrow-waisted, and muscle-bound. They reminded me of miniature versions of the opposing teams Oz and I had faced during the big game. But unlike those players, these men were armed to the teeth. They fairly bristled with swords and knives, glittering from boot tops, arm sheaths, and shoulder scabbers. 
such that I was sure the combined weight of their weapons offset that of the golden coach they were guarding. These weren't pretty de court decorations, but well-handled field weapons, worn with the ease fighting men accord the tools of their trade. The men themselves were dressed in drab tunics, suited more for crawling through thickets with knives clenched in their teeth than serving as a royal escort. Still, they wrinkled their broad, flat features into wide smiles as they alternately gawked at the building and waved at the crowd, which seemed determined to unload the earlier noted surplus of flowers by burying the coach with them. The escort may have seemed, seemed sloppy and undisciplined to the eyes of Bad Axe or Big Julie, but I wouldn't want to be the one trying to take anything away from them. Queen, coach, kingdom, or even a flower they had taken a fancy to. Two men in the procession were notable exceptions to the rule. Even on horseback, they looked to be a head and shoulder taller than the others, and half again as broad. They had crammed their massive frames into tunics, which were clean and formal and appeared to be unarmed. I noted, however, that instead of laughing or waving, they sat ramrod stiff in their saddles and surveyed their surroundings with the bored, detached attention to detail I normally associated with predators, big predators. I was about to call Badax's attention to the pair when the carriage door opened. The woman who appeared was obviously akin to most of the men in the escort. She had the same broad, solid build and facial features, only more so. My first impression was that she looked like the bottom two-thirds of an oak door, if the door was made of granite. Unsmiling, she swept the area with a withering stare, then nodded to herself and stepped down. Lady in waiting, Badax murmured. I'm not sure if his comment was meant to reassure me, but it did. Only after did it occur to me that the general had volunteered the information to keep me from running, which I had been seriously considering. The next figure in view was a radical departure from the other impassers in, her, in the party. She was arrow-thin and pale with black stringy hair that hung straight past her shoulders. Instead of the now expected round flat face, her features looked like she had been hung up by her nose to dry. She wasn't unpleasant to look at. In fact, I guessed that she was younger than I was. But the pointed nose, combined with a pair of dark, shiny, alert eyes, gave her a vaguely rodent-like appearance. Her dress was a long-sleeved white thing that would have probably looked more fetching on a clothes hanger. Without more than a glance at the assembled citizens, she gathered up what slack there was in the skirt, hopped down from the carriage, and started up the stairs toward me with the athletic lady grace of a confirmed tomboy. That is Queen Hemlock, the general supplied. I had somehow suspected as much, but having received confirmation, I sprang into action. This part, at least, I knew how to handle, having had it drilled into me over and over again by my advisors. I rose to my feet and stood regally until she reached the throne, then timed my bow to coincide with her cur curtsy, monarch greeting cur monarch and all that. Next, I was supposed to welcome her to Possetum, but before I could get my mouth open, she came up with her own greeting. Sorry I didn't curtsy any lower, but I'm not wearing a thing under this dress. Rod, it's a beastly, it's beastly hot out here in the lowlands, she said, giving me a wide but thin-lipped smile. Ah, uh, I said carefully. Ignoring my response or lack thereof, she smiled and waved at the throng, which responded with a roar of approval. What idiot invited the rabble, she asked, the smile never leaving her face. Ah, uh, I repeated. General Badax came to my rescue. No formal announcement was made, Your Majesty, but word of your arrival seems to have leaked out to the general populace. As might be expected, they are very eager to see their new queen. Looking like this, she said, baring her teeth and waving to those on the rooftops. Six days on the road in this heat without a bath or a change of clothes, and instead of a discreet welcome, half the kingdom gets to see me looking like I was dragged along behind the coach instead of riding in it. Well, it's done and we can't change it. But mind you, if it happens again, General Badax, is it? I thought so. Anyway, as I was saying, if it happens again, heads will roll. And I'm not speaking figuratively. Welcome to Postleton, I managed at last. It was a considerably abbreviated version of the speech I had planned to give, but it was as much as I could remember under the circumstances. Hello, Roddy, she said without looking at me, still waving at the crowd. I'm going to scamper off from my quarters in a second. Be a love and try not to get underfoot during the next week. There's so much to do. Besides, it looks like you're going to have your hands full with other business. How's that? You've got a wee bit of trouble coming your way, at least according to the gentleman I met on the road. Here he comes now. Bye. But... Queen Hemlock had already disappeared, vanishing into the depths of the palace like a puff of smoke. Instead, I found myself focusing on the man who had stepped from the carriage and was currently trudging up the stairs toward my throne. I observed that he had the same weasel features and manners of J.R. Grimble. Mostly, though, I noticed that the two broad-shouldered predators previously assumed to be part of the Queen's escort had suddenly materialized at his side, towering over him like a pair of bookends. Mean-looking bookends. 
I sat down, in part because the approaching figure did not seem to be royalty, but mostly because I had a feeling I wanted to be sitting down for this next interview. The, men, the man reached my throne at last, drew himself up, and gave a curt nod rather than a bow. This, at least, looked polite, since his flankers didn't acknowledge my presence at all. Forgive me for intruding on such a festive occasion, Your Majesty, the man said, but there are certain matters we need to discuss. Such as? My name is Scheister, and I re represent a consortium of businessmen. I wish to confer with one of your retainers concerning certain employees of ours who failed to report in after pursuing our interests in this region. As I mentioned earlier, I was getting pretty good at speaking bureaucrat. This man's oration, however, lost me completely. You want to what about who? The man sighed and shook his head for a moment. <sighs> the man sighed and hung his head for a moment. Let me put it to you this way, he said at last. I'm with the mob, and I want to see your magician, Skeev. It's about our army, Big Julie's boys, that sort of disappeared after tangling with him. Now, do you understand me? <laughs>